Just no, I will not leave it. What do you mean, limited skills? Now, yeah, I've won the casting final three times in a row, and you call my skills limited. How dare you! Oh. Is that any better? Isabel. <laughs> Come on, Isabel, I'll give you a lift. Wait, Derek. Aren't you going to do something? breakfast. Oh, morning, sir. Actually, I'm about to take a statement. A woman who wants to press charges of assault against Isabel Hewitt. Isabel Hewitt? Well, the Jaguar-owning pensioner. The very same. Seems there was a bit of a Barney at the Midsummer Fly Fishers last night. I'm with you. It wasn't as if she was provoked. I was the one who was provoked. Mrs. Hewitt provoked you. She told me I fished more downstream than up. The River Amble is a strictly dry fly and upstream nymph. Right, and uh, where did this happen? Outside the old fisherman. Perhaps I should explain. My husband, Derek, he's club secretary, called a special meeting. We've been finding weighted lures caught in overhanging branches on the river, the sort of thing you find in gravel pits. Anyway, he... Uh, wanted to spell out the rules, particularly to the newcomers like Isabel, and make it clear that anyone caught using such unsporting tactics would be ejected from the club on the spot. Oh, I see. And uh, did anyone suggest that Isabel was responsible for the, um, the weighted lures? No. Of course. It is odd that they've only started to appear since she joined the club, and she has caught an extraordinary number of fish, some, some very big ones. And that might have been mentioned in front of Mrs. Hewitt. The point is, Isabel Hewitt assaulted me. I have witnesses. Dr. Goff was there, he'll tell you. And I intend to press charges. Assault? Outside a pub? The woman was hysterical. Someone had to do something. What's going to happen next? We're used to the endless speeding fines and parking tickets, but physical assault. It's all over the village. But that's not what we came round here to discuss. Melrose. Uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> the thing is, Aunt Isabel... We can't go on paying off your overdraft. You are consistently spending more than you've got. We're not a bottomless pit. I'm sorry, darling. I'm just not very good at finances. Um, perhaps we could get Quentin over. No, we will not get Quentin over. He's got one of those calculator things. Uh, 
Next question. Still making a living? No. Yeah, just about. To what do we owe the pleasure? I'm moving back to the village. Andrew's taking me to look at a house. You might keep your eye open for a Georgian dining table, ten-seater. I've got the very one. Thought you might. Be in touch. You shouldn't worry so much. Something will turn up. It always does. No, it will not. You'll have to sell the car. You have no alternative. Is Isabel Hewitt at home? Isabel. I've come to say a very belated thank you. Uh, Leo, Leo Bantock, you and your husband helped my business out of a tight spot years ago when no one else would lend me a bean. I, I'm afraid I'm a little hard pressed at the moment. If you wanted a further injection. Oh, no, it's not that. No, I sold the business. Did rather well, actually, and uh, as I was passing, I thought I'd drop by and let you know that your shares are now worth a bit. Huh. Not a huge amount, probably 20 grand or so. 20? Not a bad return on 2,000. Not at all bad. How sweet of you to come and tell me. Uh, can I give you a drink? Yeah, actually, I'm just off to look at a house, and we're late already. I'm moving back to the village. Oh, lovely. We'll see you again, then. Yep. These are for you. Oh, how gorgeous. Rebecca, look. Aren't they gorgeous? We're just in time. What are we celebrating? Getting the ghastly Rebecca off my back. There couldn't be a better reason than that. There are some of the VE Day celebrations, <laughs> and one or two others. Just ignore the ones of my sculptures. I don't think they'll be of any interest. Oh, no, they're great. Thank you. So if you know of anyone else with early photos, that would be absolutely right. <laughs> She's going to kill someone one of these days. You should try Isabel Hewitt. She'll have some photographs. Her triumphs at Silverstone. Bloody hell. I knew fishermen were mad, but I suppose I'll have to get a statement from Isabel Hewitt. Yes, I'll come with you. We can call in on Cully on the way.
stop the car a minute, John. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just follow them. Turn the engine off. Don't think Isabel Hewitt will be at home. That's her Jaguar. Straight six twin cam. You can't tell that from here. Carry on. She insisted on pressing charges. Nothing I could say would change her mind. I've never seen my wife so willful. Still, I bet there's a few people who won't be sorry to see Isabel Hewitt get her come up and. Keith. The renewal for the lease of the fishing rights is coming up. You know what a stickler Sir Harry is for correct form. I hey, admit some of fly fishers are still using weighted lures on river. Old Sir Harry won't be too pleased. I don't think Sir Harry's interested in malicious gossip from a sacked keeper with a criminal record. Easy now. When you want to try and get that wife of yours to stop having catfights outside pub. Old village knows about that one. Certainly won't do reputation at fly fish as much good. Ah, Leo. Hello, Derek. Keith. So it's true then. You are moving back to the village. Pint, please. Yep. Sold the business. I've been looking at the old manor house this morning. You must have done pretty well for yourself. <laughs> Better at business than he is with women, then. Oh dear. I think I hit a nerve there. Forget I said anything. I'm surprised you come up with a comment like that, Keith. After that business I heard about your wife and Duncan Goff. What business? What a nice surprise. Is that it? Mm. Those are the photos I've got so far. I see. Go ahead. Mum's coming out later. Oh, good. Gavin. Didn't know libraries were your thing. Yeah. I kind of got talked into it. I'm setting up the exhibition in the hall tomorrow. So, what brings you to Mallonbridge? Oh, you know, run-of-the-mill stuff. Interviewing an old-age pensioner for assault. For Isabel Hewitt. Well, you won't catch her at home. She's roared through here in her Jaguar. Apparently, she likes to practice her skid control at the old airfield. <sighs> what? Is your dad ever wrong? question and I'll know if you lie to me so think very carefully before you reply oh <laughs> sorry what the Help you. It's all right, Quentin. It's the Rosses. Hello, Tom. Have you come to arrest me? I'm not sure yet. No, Sergeant Troy? No, we haven't met. Hello, Sergeant. Uh, this is Quentin Roker, my friend. How do you do? What's this about? I rather think it's in connection with my alleged assault on Margaret Seagrove last night. Assault? Yes, <laughs> it's all complete nonsense. The woman was hysterical. We need to ask you a few questions. Oh, don't worry. We have no secrets, Quentin and I. Don't you think you should have a solicitor? 
No. No, Tom's not going to do anything sneaky, are you, Tom? Oh, will you join us? I think we have a couple of spare glasses. Uh, no, thanks. Thank you all the same. Oh, of course. Of course. So what exactly happened outside the pub last night? Well, you know, it was quite extraordinary. We've all heard the expression foaming at the mouth, but I've never actually witnessed it. So you just slept her across the face? Yes. Well, we none of us wanted her bursting a blood vessel. Though I can't deny that there was a little thrill of pleasure when I actually made contact. Well, you met her. Ah, but that wasn't the motive. And that's what you detectives care about, don't you? I've got to go and see old Charlie Fuller. Painkillers aren't strong enough, apparently. <sighs> and then there's Mrs Anscombe. So don't bother about supper. I'll pick up a sandwich. Well, make sure you eat something, Duncan. Don't wait up. <laughs> Do you want me to move out? You said it was over, didn't you? It was over three years ago. Look, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Ruthie, I don't blame you. Not with your delicate mental health. Oh. Because nobody in their right mind could have gone with that old prat. That vain, incompetent quack. I don't blame you. Of course, I'll have to make a detailed examination, but it looks as though the cause of death in each case was from a powerful blow to the back of the head. The stake must have been taken from the tree planting. Which suggests it wasn't premeditated. Exactly. Seen this? 
Looks like his cause of death was pretty similar. Just saying. I had my line caught in the tree. I was looking up, trying to pull it free. Just fell over them. And you didn't see them earlier on the river? They were further upstream. So the last time you saw them was at the meeting at the Old Fisherman Pub, yeah? Oh, that's right. Well, uh, Duncan. I saw Isabel just yesterday morning. Uh, it took a chap called Leo Bantock round to her house before going on to see a property. Leo Bantock, who's he? A businessman. He knew the Hewitts a few years ago. Wanted to tell Isabel about some shares she had that had gone up in value. Twenty thousand pounds. Got his number? It's in my briefcase. He's looking at another house tomorrow morning, at the old mill. Perhaps we could see him there. Hi. What time are you meeting? Midday. That'll be very useful, thank you. Uh, will you excuse us? I found him fishing further upstream, sir. And you are? Uh, Derek Seagrove, club secretary. What's happened here? Seagrove? Margaret Seagrove's husband? Yes. DSI Barnaby, this is Detective Sergeant Troy. Mrs. Hewitt and Dr. Goff are dead. Oh, my God. I saw them both fishing just, what, an hour and a half ago, 100 yards upstream. That would have been 10 o'clock. Yes, I suppose it was, yes. Is it murder? No question. To see anyone else fishing on the river this morning? No, it was them. Just the four of us. Didn't see anyone? No. Not today. Look, I, I don't know if it's relevant, but um, we've had a problem with poachers of late. I saw one a couple of weeks ago across the meadows. Camouflage gear. Did a runner. What we've got to do first is to establish whether they were murdered together and for the same reason, or whether one of them just happened on the murder scene and was killed to protect the identity of the killer. In which case, we need to know which one of them was the real target. There's no way the two of them could have had a thing going. Yes. I know they were getting on a bit, but you never know with these wrinklies. Maybe Quentin got jealous and decided to do him in. He's weird, that bloke. Is there any family who could come and be here with you? Mrs. Goff? Uh, there's my daughter in, in Corston. How am I going to tell them? Oh, Duncan. Is he? How well did you know Mrs. Hewitt? We were at school together. Isabel Hewitt and Dr. Goff. Dead as dead. Why would anyone want to kill them? With Isabel, who knows? But Dr. Goff? Probably one jealous husband too many. What is it? Do you feel up to answering a few questions, Mr. Blanket? Go ahead. Uh, I have to ask you this. Who benefits? from your aunt's will. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, it's just... My aunt Isabel had nothing to leave. When Kenneth died a few years ago, her husband, we discovered he'd had a little trouble with the stock market. There was nothing. 
We helped out by buying the house and contents on the understanding that she could stay there for the rest of her natural life. It gave her a bit of capital. It was all above board. Uh, solicitors, written contracts. Uh... What happened to the capital? I wanted her to buy an annuity, but she wouldn't have it. Uh... She spent it. All of it. We've been bailing her out for the last year. And the 20,000 in shares? You heard about that? Well, it means she dies solvent. But only just. A big chunk of that money will be going on settling bills. Isabel had no comprehension of economy. As you can see, we don't exactly live like lords. It severely stretched us letting her live in that house. And we've had to scrimp to get by. Isabel, of course, continued to live the high life. I don't think it was quite like that. I'm sorry, it was. I know she's family and you feel you have to be loyal, but the truth is, Isabel was a very manipulative woman. Men ran around after her and she did nothing in return. Which men ran around after her? My husband, for one. And Quentin Roker, for another. Her antique dealer playmate. God knows what was going on there. Quentin runs the antique shop near Isabel's. He often helps her out. Uh... Wheedling his way into her confidence with the finances. Quentin paid the odd bill for her at the post office. That is all. Out of the goodness of his heart? Yes, I think it probably was. Anyway, to answer your question, I am the person who will benefit financially from Isabel's death in that I now have possession of my assets. Plunkett's had the strongest motive. The house, the land. It's got to be worth a million or two. In the hands of a builder. Yeah, but if they had planned it, they'd have known they were top of the list. Now, I'm more interested in the windfall. 20,000 coming just the day before the murder. <laughs> Seems a bit more than a coincidence, that, doesn't it? Well, whatever. Quentin Roker, it's got to be worth a look. I thought you should know. I'm sorry. Andrew Turner found their bodies by the river. When did it happen? Oh, but, uh, between 10 and 11 this morning. Thank God for that. Well, you were here with me. Am I a suspect? We don't have any particular suspects at this stage. But I'd like you to tell me, please, where you were between 10 and 11 this morning. I was doing housework. And you were here all morning? This is because of me and Isabel falling out, isn't it? That's why you're talking to me. Oh, we're talking to everyone, Mrs Seagrove. Can you tell us what you know about Dr Goff? Did he have any enemies at the club that you were aware of? Not really. I'd say he was generally liked. And Isabel, did she have any enemies? Besides me, you mean? Oh. I did not kill her. Oh, Dr. Goff. I may have disliked Isabel, but I could never murder her. My condolences about Isabel. I suppose, as her closest relative, Melrose will be getting the house. <laughs> Perhaps you'll be moving in. <laughs> we already own the house and have done for years. Isabel didn't have a bean. And it could be a confrontation with a 
poacher that got out of hand. Then there's Margaret Seagrove, who we know fell out with Isabel. And we haven't even got to Quentin Roker, a gay antiques dealer toy boy. Wait, could we keep a bit of an open mind on this one? The village has lost quite a character in Isabel. And what about the doctor? Was he well liked? Oh, I suppose so. Poor wife. She was obviously devastated. It's the bereaved partners that really get to you. There's something about elderly people being bereaved when they've, you know, been in love for a lifetime. Suddenly all alone. So you've not heard about his womanizing then? Dr. Goff. Serial, apparently. The night before the murders, he was seen climbing a ladder to an upstairs window of his own house at one o'clock in the morning. Word is his wife locked him out. I'll give you six fifty. You'll give me the full asking price. In fact, no, I won't accept it. I'm putting an embargo on all ill-dressed, bad-mannered people. My furniture deserves more. Don't come back. Bloody right I won't come back. <laughs> Thank you. <sighs> they can get to you after a while. To be honest, I'm finding it all a bit hard to come to terms with. Have you managed to make any sense of it yet? I'd like to ask you some questions, if I may. When did you last see Mrs. Hewitt? It's just before she went fishing. I went round to breakfast. I live above the shop here, and I often go to... used to go to Isabel's for breakfast. I'd pick up milk and a paper on the way. It was a bit of a routine. Do you have any idea who might have killed Mrs. Hewitt? Or Dr. Goff? Have you spoken to Isabel's nephew and that ghastly wife of his? We've spoken to the Plunkets, yes. Then you know all about the arrangements with Isabel's house. We know the Plunkets own it. The whole thing was a disgrace. They didn't mention how much they'd paid for it? No, well, I suppose they wouldn't. It was just after Isabel's husband, Kenneth, died. Isabel was out of her mind with grief, and they persuaded her she had to sell it to them. They rushed it through, paid virtually nothing for it. The furniture alone was worth twice what they paid. They were letting her live there till she died. Yes, but at the time, that didn't look as if it would be for very long. I'd say they were looking for a quick return. Why? Well, was she unwell at the time? She'd lost the will to live. She was fading away in front of our eyes. And then the pneumonia. Well, Duncan thought it was just a matter of days. So what happened? I suggested a spin in the Jaguar. That's all it was. Frankly, I saw it more as a farewell to the other great love of her life, besides Kenneth. It was the first time I'd driven the thing. We'd just got up to the wood by Mallon Cross, and she... She said I was driving like an Edwardian governess and she'd take over. And she did. And that was it? Pretty much. Duncan persuaded her to take up fly fishing again. She hadn't done it since she was a girl. She loved it. She got fitter, stronger. The sparkle returned. She could have gone on for years. But somehow, I don't think the Plunkett's approved of her new lease of life. Were you due to get anything in the will? I doubt it. Isabel scarcely had two beans to rub together. We have to ask you this. Where was I yesterday morning between 10 and 11? Well, I was here, apart from a 10 minute walk to the village shop. Little after 10, I would think, they'd remember. Inspector, there was a lot of resentment in this village toward Isabel. I think somehow she reminded them of everything they were not. And they didn't like it very much. Thanks for your time. Goodbye. He 
should be here shortly. He's obviously worth a few bob, this Leo Bantock. Oh, I think so. Now, what's all this about? I'm waiting. He's the murderer. You're pathetic! She chose me, not you. That's what this is about! Hey, hey! hey uh, just wait! Uh, Take him out, sorry, just walk him away. Right, you come on! Leo? You all right? You're Leo Bantock, are you? What of it? Right. Who was that fella? The one you accused of being a murderer? Keith Scully, the local restaurateur. I'm sorry. What what made you believe he's the murderer? So stupid. I told him his wife had had an affair with Dr. Goff. And you believe he killed Dr. Goff in revenge? I told him only the day before the murders. Bit of a coincidence, don't you think? And what did he mean when he said she chose him and not you? There's nothing to do with it. I used to go out with Ruth, the woman he married. But that was years ago. It's nothing. It's, it's nothing to do with this. Okay. Where can I find you? I'm staying at the pub. Right. And please, stay away from Mr. Scully, all right? He says he was nowhere near the river at the time of the murders. I was in the restaurant with my wife, and she can back me up. Did you confront your wife about the affair Leo Bantock said she'd had with Dr. Goff? She said it was over years ago, and I believe her. Did you confront Dr. Goff about it? I went round to his house, but he wasn't in. I told his wife. You told his wife? And how did Mrs. Goff react to it? Well, she was upset. Which is what you wanted. Yes, I was with Keith. When did you arrive at the restaurant and when did you leave? Um, I got there at 10 and um, helped in the kitchen. We did lunch and I suppose I left about 3. Keith stayed on. Right. The affair you had with Dr. Goff. Oh, please. It ended three years ago and it was never serious. Duncan was... Oh, he's just a very nice man. And it was a mistake. What about your relationship with Leo Bantock? <laughs> that has... That happened years ago, before I even married Keith. It's got nothing to do with this. Your husband seems to think that Leo resents the fact that you married Keith and not him. It all happened a lifetime ago. I have to sell all this. Well, I've got no use for it. I put the house on the market straight after the funeral. You're going to have to think about the arrangements. Drinks after the service. Oh, I never expect more than a glass. Crate of wine, no more. Case. What? It's a case of wine. A crate of beer. Whatever. She'll get 12 bottles and be grateful. Family only. That's final. Mum, don't you think some of Dad's old friends and patients would like to come? Pay their respects. I will not have a procession of his old flames filing past the grave. I will not. Good afternoon. I'm Detective Chief Inspector Barnaby. This is Detective Sergeant Troy. Are you Mrs. Goff's daughter? Yes. Is your mother at home? Yes. Come in. Thank you. 
Mum, it's the police. Uh, is this a bad time? No, not at all. I'd like to speak to your mother alone, please, if I may. Thank you. Mrs. Goff, we've learned that Mr. Keith Scully came round here to speak to you on the night before your husband's murder. What he told me was no surprise. Oh, you knew about the affair? Not that one specifically, but my husband had always had something of a wandering eye, and I tolerated it. We've also learned that later on that same night, your husband was seen climbing into the house through an upstairs window. He'd forgotten his keys, and he didn't want to wake me. If you think I locked him out, I didn't. Mrs. Goff, I couldn't help noticing the uh, Vegetarian Society magazine. Are you a member? Yes. Why? Just curious. I know your husband was a keen fisherman and did a bit of shooting. We had a live and let live household. You didn't eat the trout he caught, then? Fish may not be the cleverest of God's creatures, but I think to class them as vegetables is a little unkind. How goes this? What do you think? Oh, that's looking good. There's one major gap I haven't filled yet. Isabel Hewitt's obituary. Quite a woman. Demon racer. Society hostess. Apparently there's quite a collection of photographs up at the house. It'd be a pity if we couldn't include some of them. Last Melrose. He'll help you out. Mm -hmm. Oh, I nearly forgot. I heard something else about Dr Goff today. Keith Scully's mother died of cancer last year. Apparently, Keith blamed him, said his mother would have survived if he'd diagnosed it sooner. He made official complaints, and they came to nothing. Keith said it was a cover-up. I don't know why you're being so ridiculous about all this. After everything Isabel did, the way she behaved. Who are these people? Bit of a turn up then. Eh? 
Isn't that that politician? Yes. Disgraced former minister and with mistress. That one's an actress, isn't she? Oh, what's her name? I don't know. Oh, poor old Quentin. Did you find anything on him? It seems he's managed to keep his record clean, sir. My sincerest condolences. Peregrine Slade. <laughs> we thought we'd keep the service simple. Hadn't really planned on this many people. Yes, yes, I can see. Uh, would it be terribly forward of me to contribute a little something to Isabel's sending off? I have a couple of bottles of her favourite bubbly in the car. Fine. <laughs> and I've brought Hastings with me. He's very keen to help out. Aren't you, Hastings? Right. Straight through the back. Oh, well, Sandy, old chap. Give us a hand, would you? Dixie? I was so sorry to hear. Beatrice. You must be devastated. Sounds like a bit of a party, sir. Have you heard she didn't even own her own house? No. Not even a stick of furniture. <laughs> and all those airs and graces. Chelsea. I had to come down. I wouldn't be here at all if it wasn't for Izzy. Really? Oh, yeah. Back in the 60s, she was my best customer. I went through a bad patch for a while, the old cash flow, and Izzy kept me going. In fact, she upped her regular order of lobster just to keep me in business. Great lady. Loved her oysters. This is just so Isabel. Thank you. Please. Your Lordships, ladies and gentlemen, honourable members, uh, not such honourable members. <laughs> Sorry, John. It's, um, it's a very sad day for us all. We're going to miss dear Isabel rather badly. It's certainly my regret that I didn't see more of her during the last few years. I remember telling her how Moving out into the country amongst all the inbreds and hayseeds. 
How she'd lose touch with her city mates, and indeed, I was proved right. But we can see today how her old friends did not forget Isabel. Now, she may have come to somewhat of a sticky end, but it should not stop us from celebrating a well-lived life, one that I think few of us could hope to match. To Izzy and her talent for life. To Izzy. To Izzy. I'm so sorry. Now you know why Bertie was such a bargain. Well, I'm sure it's only something minor. You mean nothing fell off this time. Listen, thanks, Mum. I really do appreciate this. You're a lifesaver. Well, the man from the garage said he'd be at least two hours, and I've got to start doing these up. Have you got enough for a good show, do you think? Well, I hope so. I've still got a few more promised. I think people have been coming for the gossip as much as anything else. Mm. About the murders. Mm. Loads of theories. Most of them ridiculous. Well, I'm sure Tom will sort it all out. Mm. With Gavin's help. I just want to see you here, my dear. Don't look at the same. I suggest you leave as quickly as possible. Excuse me. I think perhaps we should circulate. Oh, you decided to come. Derek, I've found another way to lure. This time in the Three Willows stretch. You've been at the river. Isn't that where you were last night when you thought someone was watching you? Yes. And didn't you fish that stretch last thing? I'm sorry, I'm not quite with you. What if someone is deliberately planting weighted lures so as to make the midsummer fly fishers look like a bunch of unsporting gravel pitters? Someone who resents being sacked. Someone who's hoping Sir Harry will spot the lures when he walks the river. Good God. Oh, look. So sweet. The children look lovely in those huge bonnets. It's so serious. With good reason. They're in the workhouse. Most of them will probably never reach adulthood. Well, this one looks cheery. What are they celebrating? The end of the First World War. Do you know, Malambridge lost 15 men. Three from one family alone. Mrs Cooper gave me this one. She said she still remembers her grandmother weeping the day that would have been her brother's birthday. Darling, are you sure this isn't getting to you? What? It's other people's stories, not yours. You mustn't let it affect you too much. That's exactly what you say to Dad. <laughs> and you are just like him. <laughs> It's James Tapsall. Got to be. He wants us to lose the lease out of sheer spite. Now, I'm walking the river with Sir Harry the day after tomorrow, so we're going to have to keep a round-the-clock watch. Catch Tapsall at it. Can I count on you? I think you're more likely Isabel was the target. When did you last see Isabel? I spoke to her by phone the night before she was killed. She just had the most terrible row with a mutual friend. If you want to hear who, Chief Inspector, we'll have to refill my glass. You'd been partners in the antique shop a while, then. Taught him everything he knows. Yeah. He was running a bistro when I first met him. I had an antique store, Portobello Road, seven years. He was obviously very close to Isabel. <laughs> Can we have a refill here, please? <laughs> it was Dixie. She just found out Duncan had been carrying on with some local woman, and Isabel, never very big on tact, told her a few home truths. But Dixie, she, she knew about her husband's affairs, didn't she? Apparently not. I, I wouldn't read too much into it, though. They often had flare-ups. It went back a long way. Isabel went off travelling around the world with her glamorous diplomat husband. <laughs> uh, Dixie stayed in the village, sculpting Labradors, being a doctor's wife. But she was injured. Isabel could be quite mischievous. She liked to tease Dixie. Anything from her Morris Minor to her vegetarianism. <laughs> Dixie's never had any sense of humor about animal welfare. 
She used to fall out with Duncan about it as well. Excuse me. Of course. It's Beatrice, isn't it? Isabel told me all about you. I'm Quentin. Oh, you're the poodle. <laughs> of course, Isabel loved poodles. Anyway, it's lovely to meet you. I know you did so much for her. Excuse me? Sir. I've just been hearing one or two things about Quentin. habit of befriending elderly ladies. I just been talking to his old partner Steve. When Steve first met him, Quentin had just inherited several thousand pounds from a woman who was a customer at his bistro in Notting Hill. How did she die? Well, I have to check that out, but the point is, Steve reckons Quentin was expecting to make a few bob from Isabel as well. I designed the furniture in particular. You shouldn't listen to a word that little rat says. Steve was poisoned. He's been creaming off the profits from the shop, and that is why Quentin had to get rid of him. The truth is, Quentin saved Isabel's life. When Kenneth died, Isabel completely lost the will to live. I was her oldest friend, but I, I could do nothing. But then Quentin nursed her when she had pneumonia. He cheered her up. He made her laugh. Without him, I think she would have just faded away. No. Quentin was very kind to Isabel. Is that Isabel? Yes. With Kenneth. <laughs> and that was me. <laughs> mm. Believe it or not. Mrs. Goff, very glad to have found you here. But I wanted to ask you about the argument you had with Isabel right before she was killed. How did you find out about that? You did have an argument with Isabel that night, didn't you? I'm afraid I was not entirely truthful when I told you that I had always known about Duncan's affairs. It's not true. Just thought you should know. Liar! I wanted to see if Isabel knew anything. I know Duncan. He would never do such a thing. You don't think it's possible, do you? I'm sorry. You, you're saying you had no idea about Duncan's affairs? Uh, affairs? How many affairs? Oh, God! I'm sorry. I, I just assumed you knew. We all did. Are you saying that I've been an object of public ridicule and pity for my entire married life? Oh. <laughs> Well, darling, if you will marry a man ten years your junior, I mean, really, I don't know what you expected. You have affairs with younger men. You don't marry them. But we did marry. For love. At least I thought we had. Is it true you're moving back to the village? 
I was intending to. I'm not sure it's the right thing to do anymore. All this has shown there's a lot of history here. I thought I could leave it in the past and move on. No, I'm beginning to think maybe I should stay in London. Not that I want to. There's nothing for me there. talk to my wife. You're lucky I don't do you for assault. And slander. I still think you did it. You watch your mouth. If you two are going to start hitting each other again, do you think you could do it outside? My good lady wife backs up my alibi. Didn't they tell you? What? You bullied her into lying for you. You be careful. Look, if you two can't be civil to each other under the same roof, one of you should leave. Well, I'm not going anywhere. I'll see you tomorrow. Not Keith Scully's biggest fan, is he? You just missed a bit of a scene there, Chief Inspector. Chairs. Oh, yes. Still moving back, then? Have you seen they've already put the for sale sign outside Isabel's? Well, why hang about? It's what they've been waiting for. Are you thinking of saving the place from the developers? Leo, what did you mean yesterday when you said that Keith had bullied Ruth into lying for him? Oh, I was just being bloody-minded. It's just that I couldn't accept Keith wasn't involved. Yeah, but what did you mean exactly? It was just... Well, Ruth had apparently said she was with Keith in the restaurant at the time of the murders. It's his alibi. In the restaurant? That's right. Why? Nothing. Anyway, I've got to go. Detroit, the old lady that Quentin inherited the money from, she died of cancer. I still think he's dodgy. I spoke to the home beat officer at Notting Hill myself. He remembers Quentin Roker. Says he's straight as a die. Good morning. What can I do for you? A few more questions, I'm afraid, Mr. Roker. Far away. When you lived in Notting Hill, we understand you inherited a substantial amount from an elderly woman you'd befriended. A Mrs. Glenn Denning, is that right? I think I can guess where you got this from. Is it true? What are you suggesting? Just answer the question, please. Yes, she left me some money. I liked the woman. We'd been friends for some time before she became ill. It was cancer, by the way. It's not an easy one to fake. We know how she died. But you think I was tempted to speed up the process in Isabel's case, is that it? If I was going to befriend elderly women to get them to leave me their money, don't you think I could have picked somebody a little bit better off than Isabel? Are you still on for tonight? I'll pick you up at nine.
When? Yes. Do you remember on the day of the murders, mid-morning, seeing me at the village shop? Uh, yes. Do you remember what time it was? About a quarter past ten. Yes, that's what I thought. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that was all. Thank you. Stupid, wasn't it? Double murder a few days ago when you go down there in the dead of night. I'm sure it was James Tapsell, our old gamekeeper. We had to sack him when he sold some trout he'd taken from the river to a fishmonger in Corston. Now he's trying to turn Sir Harry against us, out of spite. But it was him, I'm sure of it. May or may not have been James Tapsell who was at the river last night, but if it was... You were lucky to get away with grazes and a bloody nose. Well, exactly. He can be violent. What if Isabel and Duncan had surprised him on the river? James Tapsell is one person who does have a solid alibi for the murder. He was working in the cellar of the old fisherman with the landlord all that morning. Yes, well, I don't know about that. Thing is, I caught him a good one. So whoever it was, I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't have a black eye this morning. Mr. Roker. Thank you for coming in. I didn't mention, when I told you I'd gone over to the shop that morning, the morning of the murders, that I'd knocked on the door of Keith's restaurant on the way. Keith had asked me to look out for some paintings for him, and I wanted to tell him about one that I'd found. Anyway, the thing is, there was no reply. And you didn't think this worth mentioning before? Well, there was no one there, so I don't think it contributed to any alibi. I suppose I just didn't think it was relevant. But you think it's relevant now? Well, now that I know that Keith Scully said he had been there at the time, 10.15, well, look, I don't know if any of this is of any importance. I just thought I'd better tell you. Well, I'm not sure where he is. Uh, is it important? Yeah, it could be. When did you last see your husband? Uh, last night. Um, he stayed out. Does he often stay out at night? Well, I think he was making a point. We we'd had a bit of a row. He sometimes sleeps on the sofa in the restaurant office, you know, if we've had words. That's Scully's car, isn't it? Mr. Scully? Hello? Bloody hell. 30 quid for half a lobster. Well, the muscles aren't bad. A fiver. Cutting up the vegetables, he stops. For some reason.
There's no obvious cause of death. It's probably asphyxiation or exposure to the cold of the fridge. Yeah, as soon as you can. Thanks. So, someone deliberately shut him in. What I don't understand is why he didn't open it from the inside. Standard safety features on these walk-in fridges. Look. It's rock solid, that. Oh, look. It's been wedged with a nail. Poor sod. Thought he'd try calling for help. Dropped his phone. Why didn't the murderer just close the door and put the padlock on? Why bother wedging the bolt? If you'd wedged the safety bolt beforehand, then once the door was shut, it would be effectively locked from the inside. Whereas if you had to put the padlock on, it could have taken vital seconds. In which time, poor old Keith could have pushed the door open. The murderer wouldn't have wanted Keith to know their identity. He could have written it on the wall inside. Smeared it with something, perhaps. Yeah, we'll get Socko to check that. So whoever it was would have waited outside the kitchen, heard Keith open the fridge door, run in, swung it shut, and that would have been it. Apart from turning the light out. Well, Scully wouldn't have gone into the fridge with the light off. <sighs> Nasty touch, though, wasn't it? Not enough he should die, he had to be in the dark. I'm sorry. As I knew, I mean, the door was fine. And you've no idea when or how the bolt was jammed? No, no. You got the phone? Does this belong to the restaurant? Yeah. Why? Why? Where did you find it? In the fridge. You seem surprised. No, no, it's just, well, it's normally kept over there by the um, cash till. When you spoke to us earlier, you said that you'd had a row with Keith. It was just n nothing, really. It was nothing. Mrs Scully, your husband's been murdered. You had a row with him a short time before. Now you've got to tell us exactly what the argument was about. Well, he's... He said I was being disloyal. But I wasn't, I wasn't. I was thinking about both of us. See, I was... I wasn't sure about the timings of the alibi. He said I joined him at the um, restaurant about ten. And, um, well, I thought it could have been a bit later. How much later? Well, anything up to half an hour. Hmm. But I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I thought he was the murderer. I, I didn't think that for a moment. I just, I was concerned that someone might have seen me coming into the restaurant later, uh, looking as though I'd lied about the timing. That's all it was. Ah, 
I thought I'd better drop these off. Duncan left them at the clubhouse. Thank you. Thank you for your help, Mr. Scully. I understand how hard it can be. Leo Bantock appears again. Excuse me. Oh, great. Can you deal with him? I'd like to have another look at this fridge. Oh, thanks. Sergeant. Ruth. I'm so sorry. I don't feel anything. Ruth? Um, I made the wrong choice. Marrying Keith. Why did we break up? It's all a mess now. If I can do anything. I'm glad you're here, Leo. But just give me some time, please. We're satisfied you have a solid alibi for the murders, and between you and me, I'm not too interested in doing you for assault. But we could waste a lot of valuable time trying to track down the person who's been lurking around the river. Now, if you tell me, off the record, that you were at the river last night, it saves a lot of time. I don't think you should be looking for anyone else. OK, and thank you. Topsail's our man in the camo gear, sir. But it's all to do with fishing club stuff. I double-checked his alibis for the murders, and the landlord's wife backed him up. How are we doing here? We have a dead chief suspect. We know that Keith Scully had two very solid motives for killing Dr Goff. And he persuaded his wife to give him an alibi, which she says was false. So it looks as though he wasn't where he said he was at the time of the murder. So there's enough there to charge him. But if you're going to kill someone in a kitchen full of sharp knives, why go to the trouble of wedging the safety mechanism of the walk-in fridge? Why not just stab him? Hmm. I think, so. I think. Why? Why the walk-in fridge, huh? Do you think the phone's significant? How? Ruth Scully was surprised you found it in the fridge. She said he normally left it by the till. Let's try something. 
I've got a signal. Uh, could you swing the door too, sir? There was no signal. And now there is again. The phone signals are being blocked by the door. Well, there's lead in the door, sir. Well, maybe that's it. What if... Hang on. What if Keith Scully was the murderer? And he knew we were onto him. And he was getting nervous because his wife was suspicious. Which we know she was, because that's what the row's about. And he wanted to do something to throw us off the scent. He set up a fake attempt on his own life, but he cocked it up. Keith wanted to make it look as if the murderer had tried to lock him in the fridge. That's why he jammed the safety bolt. He couldn't do it any other way. He could hardly put the padlock on from the inside. I think he planned to save himself by phoning for help from inside. He did a trial run with the door open and got a dialing tone. But what he didn't realise was that when the door was closed, there'd be no reception because of the lead in the door. Yeah, but surely he'd, he'd test his phone with the door shut, if his life depended on it. Maybe it didn't occur to him. Well, it'd have to be very stupid not to double-check that, wouldn't he? Well, there's nothing to say that murderers have to be members of Mensa, sir. Well, there is a certain surreal logic to that, yeah. So, you think it's possible? Yes, I do. We just have to get the reports from uh, forensics and pathology, but it looks like it could be case closed. Fantastic. Well done, Gavin. I'd like to have been a fly on the wall when he realised he wasn't getting a signal on his phone. Must have felt a bit of a twit. Poor man. In a walk-in fridge. He was a murderer, man. Still... Right. Same again, everyone. Troy? Oh, no more for me, thanks. I'm driving. I'll drive. Come on. You deserve it. It's a good day's work, that. Oh. Thank you, and sir. in the dark as well. Mm. So, Isabel Hewitt died just because she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. That's right. Just after a windfall, too. Have you heard? She didn't even own her own house. <sighs> Not even a stick of furniture. And all those airs and grace. Wheedling his way into her confidence with the finances. Quentin paid the odd bill for her at the post office. That is all. Same again. Same again. Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, please. Thank you. Mr. Scully, it's Tom Barnaby. Uh, yes. You know, you told us you were unsure about the reliability of your husband's alibi. Did you mention your concern to anyone else? You see, it was the phone. That was the clincher. Your governor's just nipped out for a second. He asked me to bring these over. Said he'd see you at the exhibition. Thank you. Blanket. Is your husband about? He's in the sitting room. Thank you. Front door's open. May I come in? Yes, of course. It's uh, giving me a hand with the furniture, valuing and so on. Do you know where Isabel's share certificate is? I think so. Could you show me? Yes.
That's odd. The key's usually kept... Hmm. Just must have forgotten to put it back. This is the share certificate, yeah? Yep. Could have a look at those, please. Yeah. Is this the formal agreement between yourself and Isabel for the transfer of the ownership to you of the house and furniture? Yes, it is. Melrose, the Jaguar man's here. Uh, oh, sorry, would you excuse me a moment? Yes, yes. Oh, did one thing. Your agreement with Isabel about the house, was that common knowledge in the village? No, not as far as I know. She was a proud woman. She asked us not to mention it to anyone. Thank you. Oh, don't worry. There are no secrets between Quentin and me. Finished upstairs. I think you ought to take a look at... Mr. Barnaby, have you seen Melrose? You jammed the safety mechanism so that it wasn't noticeable from the outside. And then you just picked your moment. I'm sorry. You ran a bistro in London, Quentin. You'd know all about walk-in fridges. You'd know about lead linings. As you shut the door, you threw the phone in. But you made a mistake. You shouldn't have switched the light off in the fridge. Keith wouldn't want to dial a number in the dark. A lot of his life depended on it. You're saying that I murdered Keith Scully? Yes. <laughs> Just spoken to Ruth. She told me how she explained to you in the garden at Isabel's. That she was worried about the timings in her husband's alibi. Do you remember that? Yes, you suggested to her that uh, she think about it for a day or two before telling us. So, what's that mean? Do you know, for a moment there, I thought you killed Keith out of revenge because you thought he'd killed Isabel and Duncan, but then I realized it wasn't revenge. Keith was just a decoy. We were getting a bit too close for comfort. I'm asking questions about your past. And you thought the best way to get us off your back was to convince us that someone else murdered Isabel and Duncan. And the likeliest suspect was Keith, with his iffy alibi and his solid motives. But he could always deny it, and that might cause us to doubt. Better off if he were dead. Couldn't deny anything then, could he? And why not make it look as if Keith were trying to fake his own murder and accidentally killed himself? That's even better. It must have been quite a shock when you discovered the house sale agreement in the desk. And that Isabel was penniless. What she promised you? The furniture? House? Everything? And after all you'd done for her. I've explained to you. I knew about the sale of the house. No, you didn't. Not until... Not until he found this. Right. I'm calling my solicitor. How did it happen, Quentin? Isabel asked if you could find the share certificate for her. Yes? probably just before she set off fishing that morning. And you stumbled across the sale agreement as you were searching. The two documents were next to each other. I don't know what you're talking about. Yes, you do. No, I don't! You're lying. 
I have never seen that agreement. You're quite sure? <laughs> yes, I am absolute. Well, well, maybe I did. Actually, yes, she did show it to me. Of course she did. Just after she'd signed it. That's right. <laughs> you just realised we'll find your fingerprints all over it, haven't you? That's it, isn't it? You're getting me confused. You loved her, didn't you? I don't believe you cared about the money. That's not why you killed her. And it wasn't because she conned you. And not because she didn't love you. No, it was the casual assumption that you were someone who could be bought. When you thought that what was between you and Isabel was something beautiful. I think that you loved her more than you've ever loved anything or anyone. But when you saw this document, you realized just how fundamentally unimportant you were and always have been to Isabel. You can't prove any of this. Seventy-five-year-old woman. She was extraordinary. Like a bright jewel. And I'll never see her again. I thought that knowing Isabel was the most wonderful thing that had ever happened to me. She made me. She brought out the best in me. What happened? Oh, please, Quentin, don't be so tedious. For God's sake, pull yourself together. You thought I was here for what I could get out of it. Is that what you thought of me? Of us? No, I am not putting up with these tantrums. You really can be very boring. I couldn't bear it. I just wanted to talk to her. What have you done?
Yes. I loved Isabel. The nephew was only too pleased to lend them. Bit of a memorial, I suppose. Sit down there. What's happening, sir? It's been a development. Quentin Rocco was our man after all. What? He's just confessed to the murders. All three? All three. Seems your first hunch was the right one. See, it suddenly occurred to me that if Gwen Dobson, a local gossip, didn't know about Melrose owning Isabel's house, then it was possible no one else did either. Maybe not even Quentin. It's a long story. And of course, I couldn't have got there without Troy working out that business with the fridge. That was good work, Troy, good work. Because you thought he was Quentin from the word go, didn't you? See the lesson in all this? Always follow your first instincts. I'll get the car, shall I? Yeah. Have to catch the exhibition some other time, all right? Okay, Dad. Hang on, Troy. Coming with you. <laughs> 